Shareholder proposals, it's a love-hate relationship, which I guess is better than what most people have with them. A hate-hate relationship today on Zippy Point. I'm Brock Romanek and I'm a big fan of you. So I'm sorry to say this Fed guide is not likely to teach you anything. It's just an old man telling stories. I feel like I need to get something off my chest. My first exposure to shareholder proposals was right out of law school. My first job in law was at the SEC in the Division of Corporation Finance. About two months into the gig, the division was forming its annual task force to process Rule 14A8 requests. And each new lawyer in each branch was assigned. So about a dozen of us drew that short straw. And it was a horrible process. Remember, this is 1988. There were no computers back then. So our analysis was written by hand. The only computer in the division was located in the chief counsel's, the one that's only publicly available to the people that were lower down the food chain, was located in the chief counsel's pod area. And that was only used to access no action letters on Lexus to look for precedent. So you had to stay after hours and to print off that precedent. And then you would write it up by hand and turn in your recommendations. Luckily, the number of no action requests back then were pretty slim compared to what it's like today. So I imagine I processed only about a half dozen of these requests, you know, right out of law school, not really knowing much about anything, writing my, <laughs> my recommendations probably in crayon. And then my exposure to the Sherald proposal area, nothing for five years until I went back to the SEC for my second tour of duty. And eventually I got promoted in the, into the chief counsel's office itself. And the tradition back then was that the newest member of that office, the member of the chief counsel's office, became the head of the annual task force that oversaw the shareholder proposal process. But I begged off that job. <laughs> Luckily, Frank Zarb was in the chief counsel's office and he was up for it as he'd been masterminding the the rulemaking that was going on at the time, this huge rulemaking, the last time there was a huge rulemaking in the 14A8 area. So this was 1997, 1998. That rulemaking was very controversial. The most comments ever received from the public by far on a rulemaking. And the comments were quite heated too. This was <laughs> just people sending in comments. Oh, yeah. This was like, ah, so this is back in a time too when things were tended not to get so heated. So I escaped any direct involvement for the time being other than seeing Frank and Sanjay working down the hall on the, on the rulemaking proposal. But then I left the SEC and eventually found my way to a, a more cushy job doing sales and marketing for R.R. Donnelly, launching a website for them, one of, my, one of the first ever dealing with the securities laws, realcorporatelawyer.com. That was my first website. So then in that job, I, get, I began to meet weekly with Bill Morley, who had just retired as associate director for, for Corp Fin. Bill had run the shareholder proposal process in Corp Fin for decades, and most of the law on the topic was literally in his head. It was lore. It was not written down anywhere. So I didn't want all of us to lose that institutional knowledge. So I met with Bill for six months, once a week, wrote down what he said, and I printed out literally hundreds of no action letters. And then I wrote my first legal treatise, the Shareholder Proposal Handbook, which was published by Aspen. Beth Young, super smart and, and from the institutional investor side, she participated. She was a consultant for the AFL-CIO at the time. She helped me write that thing. And of course, I had Bill's oral help. I went from knowing very little about Rule 14A8 to knowing almost more than anyone other than Bill and Marty Dunn, who had taken over for Bill and overseen the process in Corfin. So then between Aspen probably doing a pretty crummy job of marketing and the fact that only a handful of lawyers really did much shareholder proposal work back then, this was 20 years ago, the book just didn't sell. And within a year, Aspen gave me back the rights to that book. And then when I joined the corporate council.net, that book became the foundation for the nearly 300 page handbook that you see today on the corporate council.net that I updated for the last 17 years. So one more story, I became fascinated with the brothers that were the first to really leverage these shareholder proposals as a way to effectuate change. This is about a hundred years ago that they did this. Lewis and John Gilbert, known as the Gilbert brothers. It took some doing, but I managed to arrange a meeting with John's daughter, he had one kid, Margot, about a decade ago, we met in, in Denver. She was absolutely lovely and arranged for me to have access to a bunch of the Gilberts brothers materials, some of which I'm gonna to use to create another vid guide about the Gilbert brothers. Look for that, a lot of pictures and images of newspaper articles about them. They were really well known back in the day. So their story was fascinating. And, and in fact, I wanted to write a screenplay. I was so moved 
but alas, I never got around to it. Anyway, I've gone from hating shareholder proposals to loving them to feeling pretty indifferent these days. And it's interesting to me to see the occasional attempts to jumpstart some rulemaking in the area. It's such a controversial topic with a lot of valid arguments on all sides of the table, but there's almost nothing to certain and change. So I'm sure we'll see some change soon enough. Let me know what you think. Mm -hmm.